Well, welcome back. Welcome back to the Theo Faith channel. I think I've told you before, uh, Theo Faith exists to encourage and edify and equip you. Um, one of the things I'm doing in this series is answering some common objections to dispensational theology, just as the title says. Now, if you consider yourself a dispensationalist, I'm hoping that this not only encourages you in your dispensationalism, but also equips you to be able to answer this objection which comes up. Perhaps you're just exploring dispensational theology. It's new to you. You're not sure what it is. I hope that this clarifies uh, dispensationalism for you and answers maybe some objections that you will come across from time to time. And finally, if uh, you are not a dispensationalist, you're never going to be a dispensationalist, you think dispensationalism is crazy, you're not going to let your son or daughter marry a dispensationalist, then this is kind of an appeal to you not to use this objection anymore, this objection to dispensationalism that it's just too new to be true. Uh, this has come up lots of times, and it's been answered lots of times. I'm answering it again just for the sake of uh, my audience. But uh, really, this is um, kind of a straw man at this point. It's been answered so often. i also point out that uh, newness is not the criteria that we use to uh, evaluate the um, accuracy of a theology. Uh, the criteria, the standard, is the Bible. Uh, the canon means the standard, and it is the standard for any theology that seeks to explain what God is doing in the Bible. So it's uh, the fidelity to Scripture that really makes a difference, not its age. Um, now, uh, I'm not going to be um, silly about this. If someone rolls into your church uh, this afternoon or tomorrow night or something, and they claim to have a brand new teaching that no one in the history of the church ever had for 2,000 years, uh, you probably should be a little suspicious of that person. And what do you do? Do you attack the person? Well, of course not. You evaluate the claims by the Bible. That's really what you want to do here. And um, in dispensationalism, uh, it's not the newness that counts. It's whether or not it explains the Bible. Now, one of the things I'd like to do, uh, I've been accused uh, recently of demonizing some of our uh, opponents, don't want to do that at all, uh, but I do want them to speak for themselves. So what I want to do is show you uh, the, uh, a prominent theologian uh, uh, making this claim against, the bi against dispensationalism so you can hear it for yourself. So where did dispensationalism come from? Let me tell you the story. First thing to be said about a dispensational reading of the Bible is it didn't exist before the 19th century. In fact, it didn't be exist before about 1820 or so. And it really began in a little revival in Glasgow in Scotland. And there was a teenage girl named MacDonald, a good Scottish name, um, who claimed to have a vision of a pre-tribulation rapture of the church out of this world into heaven. Now, this event might have come and gone and not left much of a mark on the church itself, except that there was a certain reverend named Darby there who uh, heard this, became convinced that this theology was correct, began preaching this, and Reverend Darby uh, was one of the founders of the Plymouth Brethren denomination in the 19th century. Now again, this might have been a flash in the pan, a very small Christian sect with a peculiar belief that nobody in the first 1800 years of church history had believed in, um, except that Mr. Darby took, uh, took his gospel of the rapture to the United States. So I think that's probably sufficient to make my point of uh, uh, people accusing this of newness. Um, you know, Dr. Witherington there saying it originated in the 1830s. It was all about the rapture. 
uh, which came to them through, came to Darby through a vision from a young girl named Margaret McDonald. Uh, these are often repeated claims. They've been refuted many, many times. But we're going to just check, focus in on this newness uh, claim. It's too new to be true. You see uh, that he brought that up several times. Well, you know, I'd say that if newness were the criteria, then we'd all still be Roman Catholics. Uh, that uh, the Catholic Church looks at Protestantism and says, uh, comes to 1530, 1500 or so, and says, well, this is a brand new teaching. Uh, it's for 1500 years. The church never believed this. Why should we believe it now? So just to point out that, you know, if newness were the valid objection, I think we'd all still be Roman Catholics at this point. But what can we say? Uh, we brought up John Delson Darby. But, you know, if we're going to talk about Darby, I think we can say that he was the uh, uh, an early uh, person to articulate dispensationalism systematically. Jonathan, uh, Jonathan, John Nelson Darby, a new biography out about him, incidentally. Uh, I encourage you to read it. Uh, outstanding scholar, uh, systematic thinker. Uh, was uh, convalescing after an injury and had a, lots of time on his hands to think through things. Uh, he did uh, articulate uh, systematic dispensationalism, similar to what we understand to be today. There's been development since then, as in all theologies. But by comparison, if we look at covenant theology, uh, Heinrich Bullinger, uh, who lived from 1504 to 1575, he are, he's credited with articulating covenant theology kind of systematically only 300 years earlier. So he is not uh, like centuries before and Darby is not centuries after the covenant theology was established. It's a mere 300 years. But the real question is, um, was Darby the first? Can we say that Darby was the first and the earliest as Dr. Witherington does? I don't think we can. There's a French um, theologian, a Christian philosopher, Pierre Poiré. He's writing only about 100 years after Bullinger, so not that much longer after. His major work was this El Economy Divine. It's classic, it's Calvinistic, as were uh, basically all the early dispensationalists. It's premillennial. And it's recognized as a dispensational the, uh, systematic theology that was published in 1687. So this is uh, not long after uh, an articulation of the um, covenant theology. He identifies some major features of dispensationalism. We'd recognize it today as uh, seven dispensational um, uh, one reviewer of this, a person of putting together a biography or a bibliography of dispensationalism, said there's no question we have a genuine dispensational scheme here. He uses the phrase period or dispensation, and his seventh dispensation is a literal thousand-year reign with Christ. Uh, in bodily form, reigning on the earth with his saints and Israel regathered and converted. So lots of... Uh, common features of dispensationalism uh, well before Darby, well before 1830, and uh, not long after a systematic articulation of the covenant theology. But there's more. Uh, what we see is, and I'll admit, uh, before that there was probably no um, um, dispensationalism as we understand it uh, articulated fully, yet long before Darby, we see plenty of evidence of uh, what would be identified as uh, dispensational beliefs or tenets of dispensationalism uh, in the early church. So let's take a look at that. Um, um, Again, uh, Philip Schaff, uh, writing probably the definitive history of the Christian church. It's a multi-volume, very detailed um, work. Says the most striking point 
in the eschatology, that is the end times beliefs of the anti-Nicene age, that is before the Council of Nicaea in 325, is the prominent, what's, what's some called Chileism or Molinarianism, that is the belief of a visible reign of Christ in glory on the earth with the risen saints for a thousand years before the general resurrection and judgment. Listen to what he says here. It was indeed not the doctrine of the church embodied in any creed or form of devotion, but a widely current opinion of distinguished teachers. So I'm not going to say that dispensationalism uh, is as important as the Trinity, but uh, Trinity, the argument for the Trinity follows roughly the same lines that uh, it was never articulated because it was so widely believed it wasn't felt like a, a creed need, needed to be developed. So this major feature of dispensationalism was just part of the thinking of the church, and the church never thought they needed to define this beyond um, um, systematically because everybody believed it. We start looking at the early, what's called the early church fathers, starting in about 100, 110 to 165. We see that Justin, Justin Martyr, uh, taught that Jesus is going to reign over his kingdom um, from Jerusalem for a thousand years. That is, this is a literal kingdom on the earth for a thousand years, just as a dispensationalist would claim today. Again, just to be careful, I'm not saying that dispensationalism existed in 100. I'm saying that there, in the writings that we have, there are clear teachings that we would associate with dispensationalism today. Irenaeus, another example from that first uh, century church, uh, the second century divided history into a seven 1,000 year periods. Pseudo Ephraim, um, important document, uh, dated between 300 and 600 uh, uh, variously, teaches a two phase second coming of Jesus, uh, separated by a period of tribulation in between. And then this period of tribulation is preceded by the removal of Christians from the earth. So remember when uh, Witherington, Dr. Witherington was talking about the rapture being a new doctrine. Here we have it between three and 600 AD. Uh, the tribulation ends with Jesus's return, his final judgment and the eternal punishment of the Antichrist and Satan. Well, it sounds very similar to what dispensational teachers teach today. Pre-trib, that is uh, the rapture of the church before the tribulation and the reign, the return of Christ before the millennium premillennial. To go on, uh, Clement of Alexandria taught that Jesus is going to reign over his kingdom from Jerusalem for a thousand years. So here's the church in um, Egypt teaching this. Irenaeus divided history into dispensationalism, into dispensationals, dispensation, sorry. And Augustine himself uh, lived from 300 to mid 400s, explained uh, in one of his um, writings that um, um, God knows what is fitting for man in every age or dispensation and arranges the ages that's such that each dispensation is adapted to the second age and forms a grand melody by God. So uh, Augustine, again, I'm not saying that Augustine was a dispensationalist, but he saw, as a dispensationalist does, uh, periods in history in God's working with man that together formed what he calls a grand melody by God. So again, uh, similar uh, concepts that we find later in the systematic articulation of dispensationalism, and we find those in the early church. I mentioned pseudo-Ephraim already. I don't know why I've got this in here, so I'll skip that. I'll quote Dr. Ryrie. He's a, a prominent dispensational theologian. Really like Dr. Ryrie's writings. He's with the Lord now, but uh, very clear thinker, very clear writer. If you want to understand kind of uh, dispensational systematic theology, I'd encourage you to pick up his basic theology. It's a one volume work, very succinct, uh, very good reference to have. And you can see a kind of a systematic theology 
uh, for all of dispensationalism. But he mentions here, it's not suggested, nor should it be inferred, that these early church fathers were dispensationalists in the latter sense of the word, that is, how we would understand dispensationalism. But it is true that some of them enunciated principles that later developed into dispensationalism. It may be rightly said that they held to primitive or early dispensational-like comments or concepts. So I think that's a fair assessment. I uh, wouldn't dismiss those. They had some concepts there that would be dispensational-like, and it's unavoidable. Um, Dr. Um, Witherington mentioned the rapture. So what this chart shows is the um, kind of the history from 1830s back. So we start where Dr. Witherington said that the um, uh, pre-tribulation rapture concept started in 1830. He said it was unknown in the church before that. But it's just this chart lays out uh, the uh, concept, um, a description of a pre-tribulation rapture has a long history in the church dating all the way back to 1070s. Um, and um, probably should have referenced where I got this from, but the, um, the research continues. Uh, this is the uh, interesting thing is that the, uh, this research continues and as uh, people are continuing to look into the uh, beliefs of the early church, we're finding more and more evidence of uh, elements of dispensationalism being present in the early church. And again, I, I can't emphasize more uh, because, you know, uh, a detractor would say that, uh, well, Dr. Starcevich is claiming that the early church fathers were dispensationalists. I'm not doing that. I'm just saying that there were dispensational beliefs or uh, beliefs that are commonly associated with dispensationalists present uh, in the early church. It's not a new uh, concept, but these things have been around in the church for a long time. To go on here. Uh, my friend, uh, the late Dr. William Watson, taught here in Colorado for years and years. Uh, he's with the Lord now as well. And uh, he cataloged in his book, uh, Dispensationalism Before Darby, that uh, there were dispensational concepts current uh, being discussed uh, primarily in England uh, from the 17th through the 18th centuries. Uh, Dr. Dar or Dr. Watson, his intention was to continue to push further and further back. He wasn't saying that it's originally in the 17th century, but he was reading all the sources from that time and was able to uh, identify uh, dispensational concepts in the church in the, in the 17th century. So we can trace uh, against our detractors who claim that we have a um, new theology, we can trace elements of dispensational thought all the way back to the first century. And we can also show that the earliest systematic discussion of dispensationalism was a mere hundred years after the first articulation of covenant theology. So again, it's just a disingenuous um, accusation, I think. And just to sum this up, uh, this accusation of too new to be true, uh, hardly. Uh, the test of theology, again, is whether it explains Scripture, not how old it is. If we look at age and compare theolo uh, covenant theology with dispensationalism, uh, dispensationalism is just 100 years younger, which is not much in terms of theological articulation. Um, before that, there are key elements of dispensationalism appear very early in the 100s, um, I'd say in the New Testament as well, and uh, right through church history. Uh, we see it, um, evidence of it continuously. So, you know, my assessment that is overall that this is really unfounded. Uh, it's been refuted so often it's repeated really ad nauseum, 
And uh, it's not worthy of our opponents to continue to bring this up. It's kind of a waste of time. Um, you know, sometimes if you go to the, uh, to the zoo and you go to the gorilla cage and you look at the gorilla, he'll stay, sit there and he'll pound his fists on the ground and grab handfuls of dirt and throw it up in the air and he's just making a big display to try to sh scare off his adversaries. I think this is what this is a lot of gorilla dust. Uh, it's really fo uh, without foundation, and uh, I think it's time for us to move on, don't you? So God bless you, brothers and sisters. I pray that this is useful to you. I'm trying to keep them short and uh, to the point. And again, my intention is to encourage you, uh, to edify you in your faith, and to equip you as you uh, pursue uh, the Lord and. Spend time in his word. So God bless you, brothers and sisters.